take my hands and now we're holding hands. I can do like hand clasp, different things like that. But if she doesn't, we're still talking, there's still other things going on. I just understand that that was a no for now, but it wasn't a big deal made out of it. Okay? So that's what I'm constantly doing. I'm constantly escalating. Constantly. If you guys ever see me in, well, you're going to see me in set. But when you see me in set, I'm, I'm escalating much of the time. But I'm escalating in such ways that if it's rejected, it's not a big deal. All right, um, so let's talk about the hook. Basically, the hook has always been kind of a, an interesting phase in game. A lot of guys are like, you know, I can't get the set to hook, or sometimes it hooks, sometimes it doesn't. It's always like very nebulous. It's like, you know, sometimes it's on, sometimes it's not. I can't really figure it out. I know that when, I, I know that when I'm more self-amusing, it hooks, right? The more I'm having fun and not asking for something from her, that helps it hook. That tends to be a, a correlation a lot of people have. Or um, I know when I'm in state, it hooks more. Okay, fair enough. Um, but those aren't really things that are, are that easily controlled, right? It's hard to control like, okay, I need to hook the set, so I better get into state right now. Let me get into state right now. It doesn't work like that. You can't control that. You can't overtly do something about that. Or um, you can't control like the, if the initial reaction is good, you hook, and if the initial reaction is bad, you don't hook. Well, that initial reaction, there's only so much you can do about it, right? So ideally, sets will hook without you having to think about them. That's perfect. Perfect is when you open and they just like insta hook for you. Or um, you just start self amusing and the girl starts committing and starts chasing you. That's great when it happens. However, most of the time, especially with hot girls, especially with difficult sets, that's not going to happen. And so, with that said, I've been thinking about it for a really long time and I finally have come up with a structure for exactly how the hook occurs. And the way this happened was I had a student who, um, he was one of the students at Immersion. And he brought some different um, video to me. Like he'd, we'd filmed him, and he brought these like different situations where he's trying to open a girl, and he wasn't getting the hook in any of the situations. And he was like, "I can't get the hook. I can't, can you explain to me why?" And so the first situation, I was like, "Okay, so here you're trying for too much compliance, and that's that's why you didn't get it. So okay, then maybe that's your problem." And then the next time, I'm like, "Well, okay, so here you're actually not escalating at all. You're not asking for any compliance." So that's a complete contradiction to what I just taught you. Um, but I, I'm seeing it, and I know the reason why you didn't get the hook here is because you're not trying for compliance here. Right? Um, and then the next one, I'm like, he's, he's watching it, and I'm like, yeah, so here you're just talking about, I mean, you're, you're trying to escalate and everything, like, sort of physically and, and whatnot, but you're just talking about, like, random topics. It's not about you and her on any level. It's just this, like, nebulous conversation. Right? And so now we have three different sets that didn't hook, and they're for three completely different reasons that totally contradict each other. And so I'm sitting here trying to explain it to him, like, well, see, in this one you did this, and this one you did this. And so the principle is, fuck, right? <laughs> um, and so I really sat there for a minute and tried to break, like, break it down. I was like, well, okay, what's really happening here is that in this one you got to a certain place in the hook, and then it failed. In this one you got to a certain place in the hook, and then it failed. In this you got to a different place, and then it failed. And so what I realized is the hook isn't like a distinct one thing that happens. There's sort of phases to the hook. And when you understand that, you can understand how all these different sorts of failures are all failure to hook at the same time and how they all contribute. Okay? And so we're going to break that down for you. Um, I came up with a model um, for hooking. Um, so the Fred model for hooking. <clears throat> Basically, here's how it works. First step, focus. You must have her focus in order to hook. If you don't have her attention, you will not get her hooked. Okay? Focus. Next one. Relevance. Okay? You must make it relevant to her. If you're talking about nebulous topics, you are not going to hook her into that idea. You're not going to hook her into a conversation that means nothing to her. You must make it meaningful to her. Okay? Next, emotion. It must not just be theoretically meaningful to her. There must be some emotional involvement or emotional impact. She has to have commitment. She has to have some chemicals running through her body. Okay? And then lastly is decision. Focus, relevance, emotion, decision. Fred, okay? We're thinking about putting like, during hot seat, literally to like some like old fat guy on, on, on stage and be like, this is Fred. This works even for him. Um, but anyway, so that's the Fred method, okay? Focus, relevance, emotion, decision. Focus basically means when you open, you need to get her attention. You need her attention on you. And if you have lost her attention, rather than trying other things to get the hook, the first thing to do is get her attention back. Fundamental to everything you do in game, you must have her attention. If you don't have her attention, you are not gaming her. You are not doing well. 
And I'm going to show you guys an Amog set later on <clears throat> where you'll see this extraordinarily clearly, where the girl likes another guy way more than she likes me, but I take her attention. And I put him in a situation where he has to do something awkward if he's going to get it back. And just by having attention, even though she doesn't like me yet, she likes him, I have the upper hand all of a sudden because of that simple thing of attention, all right? Attention is paramount. Open strong, open hard, make sure you have the attention. Secondly, if you lose the attention, don't tolerate being in a conversation where she's all over the place not paying attention to you, okay? Now this doesn't mean be completely anal retentive about it either, <clears throat> okay? If you're talking with a girl for a long time, she likes you, and then she's over at the bar and she wants to go grab a quick drink with her friend, like she's, you're sitting by the bar, she wants to turn and order a drink, and she's talking to her friend, you can let her talk to the friend while ordering the drink and trust that she'll come back to you in a minute, right? Because there's a specific process, the start and end to that task, and when the task is over, then at that point you can be like, hey, and grab her attention back, grab her focus back. Does that make sense? You don't have to have her focus every single moment, but what you do have to do is you have to have an idea of where her focus is at and how you're going to get it back and when you're going to get it back. Does that make sense? If you don't have her focus, you're not gaming at that moment. Focus is paramount. Okay. Next, relevance. What is relevant? What is relevant to someone? Anything. What, what, what things are relevant? What things do you care about in your life? Yourself. Yourself, yes. That's a very good example. Here's what you care about. Here's what, uh, here's what gets a reaction from you, and here's what um, you focus on, actually. But here's what gets a reaction from you. You get a reaction, or you give a reaction to things that you perceive of as value, or threat. If you perceive of something as having value, you will pay attention to it, it's relevant to you. If you perceive it as a threat, it's relevant to you. This goes back to the jungles, right? If we see food, that's value. That makes us survive. If we see a resource that we can turn into tools, that's value, it's relevant to us. It has meaning to us, all right? If we see a predator, that's a threat. That has meaning to us. Or if we see some guy is like getting angry, is probably gonna fight us, that's a threat, that's relevant to us, okay? Those are relevant. Things that are value or a threat are relevant. And so why, is, why are ourselves relevant, information about ourselves? Because information about ourselves is by its nature usually either a value or a threat. If we can understand how the world perceives us, we can utilize that information to either have more success or to avoid failure, All right? So that's what we're looking for. You wanna become value or threat. So how can you do this? Well, a couple different ways. You can be valuable to someone by having some sort of insight about them. That's one very good shortcut, right? You know what I notice about you that's so interesting? Boom, all of a sudden you have value, right? Because they want to know. Even if they don't like you, even if they don't know you yet, the fact that you are making it about them, there's some value there, okay? You want an example of threat? Dog, slut. That's a threat. I hate you. That's a threat. Make sense? That's a threat to their ego. That's a threat to their self-esteem. That's a threat to their social perception. Right? That's another way to get their attention. That's another way to get them more invested in the interaction, right? is by making a threat. So what you want to do once you have their attention is very early on do something that's either of value or threat. Okay? Value doesn't necessarily always have to be about them. If you have something interesting to teach them in general, for example, if you were an expert on a particular subject and they had some interest in that subject, that could be interesting too. A lot of guys do very well by becoming the teacher role, right? Becoming the teacher role of, I can teach you something about humanity, I can teach you something about business, I can teach you something about making money, I can teach you something about whatever, right? I can teach you how to play the guitar, whatever. If you have some other form of value, that's fine too. It doesn't necessarily have to be about them, but because you don't know the person you're dealing with well on a cold approach, Usually a good shortcut is to think that about them is a likely scenario, okay? So you wanna do that, make it, what we call ad hominem, make it about them, whether of threat or of value. Make sense? So that's the next stage, and that's where you get into things like <coughs> um, a, lot of my, a lot of my interactions will be either like an immediate push-pull statement, like I like you but I hate you, or there's something about you I like, there's something about you I'm not sure, or your vibe is very interesting, Something like that. It's something that's a little bit of a cold read, something that's about them, something that makes it relevant to them, right? It also gives context and reason for the interaction. So it's not this nebulous interaction. They have some idea of the premise for it. And premise will keep people there as well. Yeah? I've been using that a lot. 
Uh huh. It works well, but I get stuck sometimes. I was like, you know, just something really awesome about your computer or whatever, and I like let it flip, and I just can't find the negative thing because I really like the code. You're 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 dumb or something like that. Shit, it just comes out very new guru. Like, what's the move to do in that situation? Like, do you always like just pick up the perfect thing or you just make up shit up? You know what? You're so cute, and I hate that I feel that way about you. So it just doesn't matter. Yeah. I love, but I hate blank. You're so cute, and I want to have a crush on you. I want to trust you. And because I feel so good with you, that makes me nervous. That's a negative, right? Any of that. Just go with any of that. As long as you right? Have or you can be like, you know what? You're so amazing. You're so cute that, like, I literally know that at some point I'm just going to not even know what to say to you. And I'm going to be a loss for words. And that's just going to be fucking awkward. So let's just end it now. Okay. Right? Yeah, why not? You can come up with anything. The, co the actual, like, literal meaning, even though that's actually, like, saying you're so amazing and you're even more amazing is the literal meaning, is still in the format of a push-pull, so it will still have the same emotional reaction or same emotional effectiveness of a push-pull. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can do that. Just, like, literally say whatever's in your head. Just couch it in that way. Right? And you can say, <coughs> you can say almost anything um, in a way that's extremely negative, extremely positive, or anywhere in between. Like, for example... Um, you can say, you're fucking hot. You can say, oh, you're actually relatively cute. You say like, hmm, you're kind of cute-ish, right? You can take the same thing and you can say it so many different ways, right? Or be like, wow, you're uh, actually kind of cute, right? But, and they're like, actually, what do you mean? You didn't think I'd be cute, right? You can say it by just couching it or just like using a little softener word here or there. You can completely change the meaning and you can turn a statement that's all positive into a one statement push pull, right? Um, or you can take something very negative and you can do it um, that way too. Like, um, wow, you are like phenomenally evil, right? With a smile on your face, right? And that's, I'll, I'll say that as like, you are so much trouble, right? Which is like a negative, but I'm saying with a smile on my face and with arousal. And so it's like a push pull in that one statement. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Try, yeah. Hooking to a certain extent is an art. Like, I'm not going to say that like, once I've taught you like, the technical steps to hooking, you're going to hook every set. But what you will be able to do is when your sets hook, you'll understand why. And when your sets don't hook, you'll understand why. So that you'll be able to, like, your brain will interpret it better and you'll become more consistent through the feedback. Right? I'm not going to say that after hearing this, all of a sudden you're going to go out and never have a set not hook. That's a lie. But at least I'll give you a context so you can learn it better. OK. Um, so that's. Focus, relevance. Next one is emotion. Emotion. Super, super critical, OK? So say that the relevance is um, I can teach you some interesting fact about life. That's fine. You could even use that. In fact, a lot of our like, sort of pre-scripted routines back in the day were like that. Be like, hey, you know what's really interesting? I saw this interesting news thing. Or hey, this is really interesting. I can ch check out this little cool trick I can do. Right? That's something interesting and relevant about life. Um, so that's useful in that way. But the problem is, once you finish that topic, your relevance ends. Because right? your relevance is tied to the topic and not tied to you. Does that make sense? Right? So say that you are someone's teacher in a class. As long as you're teaching that class and they're taking notes and they care about the class, you're relevant. As soon as class is over, your relevance is zero. Right? You don't want that. So here's where emotion comes in. You need to make it emotional. You need to make it man to woman, make it you and them, and tie it to yourself, OK? So that's when you want to say things like, like you can say like you have a very interesting look, that's relevance. But now you say you have a really interesting look, I kind of love it and I kind of hate it. Now you're tying it to you. You see that distinction? Right? You have an interesting look, OK, once you're done talking about the look, you're done. You have an interesting look, I kind of love you and I kind of hate you, now you're getting closer to making it emotionally relevant, right? Or um, you could say, you have an interesting look. Um, I bet that has led to you being perceived as a certain way, or you being perceived in a certain way. And now you're tying into like, the emotions they've had in other parts of their life. Right? You're tying into an emotional experience for them, rather than just a factual conversation. Because okay? what are emotions? Emotions quite literally are chemicals in the body. They quite literally are like chemicals and hormones flowing through your body. Okay? And the great thing about them is they will motivate us to do things that we would never be able to do without them. If we didn't have emotions, um, we would, there's, a, there's an old, um, this is a, a long-winded way of explaining it, but it's the best way I know. Um, there's an old paradox in computer science. It's called like the burden's donkey paradox. And the way it works is there's this donkey, 
And on one side of him, he has a big pail of water. Another side of him, he has a big tub of food. And he sits there thinking, I'm kind of thirsty, maybe I'll drink. And then he gets, a, and then he goes like, no, no, I'm more, I'm more hungry, I think I'll eat. And they go, no, I'm more thirsty, I'll drink. No, I'm more hungry, I'll eat. And he just sits there going back and forth, not knowing which is the bigger priority, until he dies of hunger and thirst. Okay? Now that's a dumb story in real life, because no donkey would do that, no human being would do that. But a computer will do that. A computer, if it's not given a priority, will just vacillate and not do anything. Or vacillate and get like an infinite loop or something like that, right? So in computer science, this is like an important metaphor. Because that's what would happen if we didn't have emotions. That's what a computer is. A computer is thought without emotion, right? And so without that emotional compulsion, there's no drive to go anywhere. There's no drive to do anything. You're not going to get a girl into you without compelling her emotionally, without getting those chemicals running in her body. It's so, so, so important. However, the problem with the chemicals is the chemicals will eventually subside. Eventually, if you stop stimulating her, the chemicals will flush out of her system and she won't feel that way anymore. Okay? So once you have that emotion, you have those chemicals, you have that ability to motivate and control and get something to happen. But if you don't do something with it, if you don't turn it into something tangible in the real world outside of just the chemicals in her body, when they subside, she will forget about you and flake. Or she will be that girl that's like happy, fun, kissing you and then be like, okay, bye, take care, and not attach to you. Because she, she hasn't made it tangible. Okay? And that's where the decision phase comes in. And this is what almost everybody misses. Right? I mean, I guess all these stages are things people miss, but the decision phase is what the advanced guys miss. The advanced guys don't get the decision phase. They don't get that compliance when they have that emotion. So the girl's feeling all emotional and bubbly and great, and then you get her, and then you're like, at that, at that height of emotion, when she wants you there more than she's ever wanted anyone there, you go, you know what? Um, you don't have to talk to me if you don't want to. You can go. And at that moment, she really, really doesn't want to go. And so she's like, no, I'm, I'm good here. As soon as she says, I'm good here, now she's made that commitment to you. Now she's taken these emotions in her body and she's turned them into something real and tangible in the world. And that's when you have a solid hook. That's the equivalent to like when you're fishing and you get that little bite on the hook. And then like if you were just to reel it in, you probably wouldn't catch the fish. But if you set that hook hard and like get it really in the lip of the fish, that's when you have the hook. That's what the decision is. That's setting the hook, making sure there's that compliance. Okay? So that's the key thing to making a hook that lasts. And that's the key thing to getting a girl that will chase you and getting a set where she'll tell her friends, um, this is the ideal set, this is not gonna happen often, this happened to be like a few times in my life, but the ideal set that you want is the set where at the end of the night, she says to her friends, look, I know you guys are trying to protect me, you're probably right, I'm probably dumb, but I like this guy, I'm going with him, and I don't care, deal with it. And then walks off with you, okay? I've even had girls stay in a country when their friends are leaving the country to stay with me and do that. That's fucking compliance. That's when you have a logical commitment. That's your ideal. It's not gonna happen every set, but that's the ideal. That's what extreme compliance is, okay? Now, when you're looking for this decision phase, when you're looking for this compliance, it can happen in two forms. One is compliance, which is they come with you, right? Hey, come here, do this, and they do it. That's actual compliance. The other is non-non-compliance. Okay, and what that is, is when you do something that they should object to or they should reject you for, and they don't. Say you're, you're talking to a girl, and you say to a girl, oh my god, you're such a fucking slut, I hate you. And she doesn't get angry, and she doesn't slap you in the face, and she doesn't run away, because she likes you too much and she's afraid to do it. In her mind, she has to rationalize to herself why she didn't. That's also a form of compliance. Okay, so that's a, a passive form of compliance. So one form of compliance is you say do this and she does it, or you they pull her in and she does something with you physically. But then non-non-compliance is when you do something they should object to and they don't. But you need one or the other of those to really, really set the hook. Okay? So those are the stages of hooking. Focus, relevance, emotion, decision. If you get those four, you have a hook. Now, in longer sets where like the hook takes a while, it's very easy to notice these distinct phases. But my contention is that even in the sets that hook immediately or that you seem to have instantly hooked, all these phases occurred, they just happened lightning fast. Okay? So for example, say that you do this. Hey, you, come here. Oh, you're so cute. Right? Right there. The yeah, yeah. yeah. It's okay. You can face the camera too. Okay, cool. So that's an instant hook. Go ahead and sit down. So that's an immediate hook. But what happened, right? Hey, had the attention. You, it's about you, it's relevant, it's a threat, it's something, right? It's a value or a threat, there's something going on, right? And then, 
Come here, there's like that motion, that motion, that intensity in the eyes, which is going to create some kind of emotion, and then you, and then she complied to it. So within that like split second, I went through all four phases. Does that make sense? Focus, relevance, emotion, decision, bam, immediately. And that can happen. And that's why you get your instantaneous hooks sometimes. There'll be other times, I'm like, hey, you, and she's like resistant. So now I have her focus a little bit, no relevance, no emotion, no decision. And then I have to work through a process to get there. Right? So some sets will hook quickly, some sets will hook longer. But that same process for the hook is in existence in all the sets. Does that make sense? Cool. So that's how to do the hook phase. Questions on any of that? <laughs> Lots. Good. Uh, so basically, like when you're at an emotional high, that's when you should go for the decision. Like specifically, when you're at a high. Yeah. Um, when you're at an emotional high, you are. It's a good time to escalate in general, and it's a good time to do pushaways in general. Okay. It's a good time to escalate because the escalation will be received, so you can escalate without risking a lot of social capital. Right? So you can, you're, you're likely to get success, so it's likely to be a good escalation. And then on the other hand, it's a good time to do a push away because when it's on a high point and you push away, <clears throat> they're very likely to actually run away. They're very likely to try and snap back and get your attention back. Right? So yeah, most of your either like po extreme positive or negative expressions, your extreme escalation, your extreme negatives, should occur at high points. Those are the best optimal times for them, for sure. Yeah? Um, uh, so how do you run Um, I think that self-amusement is not a direct form of hooking. It's a, it's a cross your fingers and hope form of hooking, but it's very effective. And the reason it's very effective is because self-amusing is one of the best ways to convey value. Right? And so let's say you have focus, right? and then you need that relevance. That's going to come from either value or threat. So self-amusing is conveying value threat very strongly. Okay? And so when you're conveying value, value, value or threat strongly, you're going to keep their attention for a period of time. And by keeping your, that, period, that attention for a period of time, there's a high likelihood that there will be some emotional, something emotional that will happen that they can then lock onto. And the locking on may or may not happen organically. So you're hoping it happens organically. right? However, also, when you're having high value, when you have high value, people do react emotionally to high value itself. So you're very likely to get through that third phase of emotion as well. And if you self-amuse long enough, you have value, you have that emotion. And that emotion in the body, one of two things, either you will get some commitment or compliance at some point, again, by accident. Or if they have that feeling around you for long enough, even without commitment, they can sort of, sort of start to associate it with you. So that is another way to hook, right? So what you're doing when you self-amuse is you're ensuring that you're going to keep attention or you're going to keep focus and you're, uh, you're maintaining that you're going to keep relevance because you're being value threat very strongly, right? So you're, you're basically saying by self-amusing that I'm going to stay good on those two levels, which means they'll stay with me and they'll stay engaged and aroused and a lot of good things could happen from there. But my contention is if you're self-amusing and understand this, you can make those last two phases happen much more regularly and much more quickly on an ongoing basis. Right? So I would say combine the two. If you're not self-amused and if you seem reaction seeking, you're going to fail at the second stage, which is the relevant stage. For example, say that a homeless person comes up and talks to you. Right? He can get you to focus. He can yell at you, you'll focus. But whatever he's going to say to you, there's no relevance because you don't view him as value. And if you view him as a threat, the way you view him as a threat is like a physical threat, so you're going to run away. Right? So he can't, because of the nature of his interaction with you, he can't be perceived as value or threat. So he's not going to keep you there long enough to get anything real out of it. Does that make sense? And that's because he's needy and not self-amused, and he, he's, he wants something in the interaction. By being self-amused, you're ensuring that you buy yourself that window for the good things to happen. Yeah, how do you uh, screen for blueprints? Like, what type of things do you say? That's an interesting question. I've never overtly thought about that. Um, usually with me, it comes up naturally. Um, although I do screen for blueprints when I'm looking to pull a girl. Um, and so there, I guess, to take the metaphor of what I do there to everything, what I would do is think about what blueprints are common and then ask questions which are indicative of them or do little tests which are indicative of them. So for example, um, one common blueprint might be the girl who wants like rules and structure. 
right? So you could ask a girl, um, are you the type of person who likes, you know, likes rules and structure and likes to know like what you're doing in life, or you're the type of person who likes to like kind of figure it out and like have sort of like the freedom to, to go your own your go your own way. Right? You could ask something like that, and depending on our answer, that could tell you, right? And what you can do when doing that, because blueprint is not a static thing. Blueprint is fluid. Okay, so a girl's blueprint with um, a celebrity would be different than a girl's blueprint with someone who are who who they know like through like their their school and like are friends first with and maybe will consider a relationship down the road right there's a different blueprint to that context and there's a different they're they're basically playing a different role so when you screen for blueprint you're also directing blueprint if you're smart about it and when you're screening for logistics when you're screening to try and take a girl home or trying to like get a girl to leave a club with you you're finding out her like availability but you're also indicating to her the right things to say and you're, you're sort of moving her availability in that direction okay so for example one thing that I'll do to screen for pulling a girl is I would say um, well I'd like to screen for how how protective are your friends right and I've always wanted to ask that question but I was always afraid to ask that question because it's so obvious it's so obvious I'm trying to pull them right and so what I came up with to do that is I, I softened it and I also added the incentive for them to go a certain way. So I'd be like, so your friends, are they like, are they like extremely uptight and like if you walk five feet away from them, they'll call the police or are they like cool people who like know how to chill and like realize that you're an adult, right? So you're screening for it and even saying it that way, some people are like, no, my friends are very protective and you'll find out. But you're also encouraging the proper answer. Make sense? Um, so understand that that blueprint is fluid and especially if a girl is attached to you or wants to please you they will change their answers to things and will change their outlook so you do want to screen it but you also want to influence it at the same time as you are screening it and so if that makes sense as well um, but a lot of it could happen organically the other thing that is really good and this will come in to the next phase which is the emotional connection phase but it's the idea of qualification Right, so qualifying a girl is getting her to jump through your hoops, finding out the reasons why you like her. Um, but in the qualifying, you'll find out a lot about, about Blueprint. So you, basically what I suggest, and this is good for, for everyone here, is think of like five non-physical things you'd like in a girl. And then when you're talking to the girl, once you have a hook, once you have a set that's willing to stay there and is a little bit invested, start finding out if she's those things you like. Because so that's gonna do two things. Number one, it's gonna screen. Number two, it's gonna encourage. It's going to encourage her to be those things. So it's going to lead her down that path. Does that make sense? Um, but in order to be screening for blueprints, I guess the answer is you need to know what blueprints you're screening for. Because you, you, you can either, you can either like just have the conversation and then just be aware when the things pop up. But if you want to overtly screen for a blueprint, have in your mind, here are the blueprints of girls I like, or here are the blueprints I want to encourage. And then you have to like sort of proactively screen. It's like if you do a science experiment, you usually start with a hypothesis. You start with something you're trying to test, and then you do an experiment to test it. You don't just like look at nature and consider that science. I mean, you can, you can get ideas from that, but you want to start with a hypothesis if you're trying to be formulaic. Make sense? Let's say you look at her already, or you're pretty close, whatever, mm -hmm. and you just find yourself in a situation where you're chasing, chasing, chasing. I, I find myself in that situation a lot. Mm -hmm. I get pissed because I'm like, God dang it, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to flip that. Mm -hmm. Can you go into that? It's tough because it depends on what you're chasing. If you're chasing her attention, you're in bad shape. Like if you have to keep going, hey, 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 come back, come back for attention, that's really tough and you're probably screwed. I'm talking more but, about I'm escalating and it's just, you know. Right. So if you're there, now you want to think about, it sounds like you have some hooked but not all the way hooked. Right? It sounds like you have a partially hooked set. Right? So it sounds like you probably have... Some, re some relevance, some emotion, but she hasn't made any firm decision. So what I would do is I'd give her encouragement to make a decision. I'd do things like leave a little silence in the set. Or I'd do things like, instead of qualifying yourself, instead of saying how amazing you are, go the opposite way for a while and be like, nah, I'm nothing special. I seem charming at first, it goes away, don't worry. That kind of stuff. And make her commit to the fact that she's staying there even though you're doing unimpressive things or even though you're doing sort of like slightly value, uh, or sorry, uh, rapport breaking things. Right, so I'd use, use that as an example. And then the most overt example would be I'd tell the girl she's free to go at times, but when it's at an emotional high. So even if you've been chasing, chasing, but it's an emotional high point is pretty good, you could tell her, oh, it's okay, you can go now. 
right at that moment of emotional high, and that'll force it to force it to flip. Yeah, yeah, but that's tough. The, if you're if you're chasing the attention, you're fucked, or you're in really really bad shape. But if you're chasing, if you're anything past the attention phase, it's theoretically winnable. Does that make sense? Yeah. You just have to like work through it, and it may take it may take several tries. It may be a slow process of like switching the frame, but as long as you have the attention and, and are able to lead a little bit, you can theoretically chip away at it and get there. Um, all right, so let's do emotional connection. We'll actually do emotional and physical connection a little bit 